Hi, and welcome to The Turbulent World with me, James M. Dorsey, as your host. Words matter, no more so than in legal settings. Genocide is the word most associated with Israel's more than one-month-long assault on Gaza in response to the October 7 Hamas attack against Israel, in which at least 1,200 mostly civilian Israelis were killed. Genocide and Holocaust scholars, including those who believe that Israel has and is committing war crimes in its assault, are divided about whether Israeli actions amount to genocide. Even so, they warn that Israeli actions could lead to genocide if it are not already has. What is certain is that optics streaming out of Gaza of the destruction and the plight of innocent Palestinian civilians, including large numbers of children and babies, explain the popular use of the term genocide when discussing the Israeli assault. To get some proper definitions and put things in perspective, I am joined today by Professor Omer Bartov, a world-renowned genocide and Holocaust scholar at Brown University in Rhode Island. Omer Bartov, welcome to the show, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Perhaps we can start on a personal note. I'm curious about what got you interested in genocide studies. Obviously, the ethics of the conduct of war are not purely theory to you. You were born in Israel and served in the Israeli military during the 1973 Middle East War, which caught, like October 7, Israel off guard. Uh, yes, uh, you're right. I have a long-standing interest in this issue. Um, it began really with my interest in war crimes. Um, I, uh, as a teenager, I was very interested in military history. And then, as you said, I served in the army. I ended up being a an officer, a company commander, and I kept also reading on uh, on war. And what I became interested in was the the tension between the kind of uh, aura that the German military, the Wehrmacht, had in World War II as an excellent fighting force and the crimes that it's claimed had been committed uh, in the rear, behind the backs of the heroic uh, soldiers of the Wehrmacht. Uh, and I became skeptical about that, uh, particularly regarding the war in the Soviet Union. And so my first research was really to see whether the army, the German army of that time, and the veterans and the generals who came out of that army were telling the truth about the fact that the crimes were committed by the SS, by the Gestapo, but never by the honorable German army. And obviously, that was not the case. So I spent several years uh, digging through German archives and discovered that the German army, A, participated heavily in war crimes, which is not surprising considering the close to 30 million uh, Soviet soldiers and and civilians were murdered uh, during that war, uh, and B, that these soldiers were heavily indoctrinated, so they were not uh, participating in war crimes only because war is terrible, which it is, but also because they had been indoctrinated into believing that they were fighting subhumans, untermenschen. So that was the beginning of my interest in this question. It actually started, as I said, with war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide because the German military was involved uh, in the genocide of the Jews, not as the main organizer, but as the facilitator of uh, mass murder of Jews. And from there, I started studying genocide uh, more generally and ended up also studying the Holocaust uh, more specifically. Um, now, of course, I grew up uh, in Israel, um, in my childhood, we were surrounded by Holocaust survivors. There were many people, you know, you could see with the numbers tattooed uh, on the forearms. Um, there were many of my friends who's, <clears throat> you know, who, whose parents were traumatized, who would uh, scream at night from nightmares. I mean, this was part of the scene in which you grew up. Uh, but 
as I realized later on, we also were growing up in a country, uh, I was born in the 50s, uh, that had just also ethnically cleansed the Palestinian population that had lived in the neighborhoods in which we were growing up. Um, and so that kind of realization uh, of everything that had happened to members of my generation shortly before I was born, um, the, the Holocaust and the trauma of that, and the creation of the State of Israel, much of it on the ruins of what had been Palestinian, Palestinian civilization, I think it's formed much of my own interest uh, since then until to this day. I want to come back to some of the things you just said, but let's start off with uh, trying to get some definitions. If I understand the law correctly, intent is a key factor in determining whether actions amount to genocide. I think it would be helpful if you could define what constitutes intent and what the legal difference is between genocide ethnic cleansing, or crimes against humanity. Right. So so it is important to make these distinctions. Um, uh, war crimes, uh, which are defined in the 1949 Geneva Conventions and subsequent protocols, um, are defined as serious violations of the laws and customs of war in international armed conflict, which means war between states against both combatants and civilians. So these, these are crimes that are committed within the context of war against soldiers and civilians. Uh, crimes against humanity, for, for which there's no uh, direct convention, are defined in the Rome Statute, uh, which uh, then established the International Criminal Court. Uh, the term was already used, of course, in Nuremberg, but the definition from the, in the Nuremberg Tribunal of 1945 but the definition in the Rome Statute uh, defines crimes against humanity as extermination of or other mass crimes against any civilian population, and that does not have to be at a time of war, and also does not call for direct intent. It's uh, just mass killing of uh, civilians. The crime of genocide is a, is a particularly uh, um, a somewhat bizarre um, convention. Uh, and it's it, and it's important to understand exactly what it says. So the crime of genocide is defined and was defined in 1948 uh, by the UN as the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethical, racial, or religious group as such. So that means that in order to identify genocide, you need two elements. One element is intent, that there is... Uh, that you can identify the, the organization or the state carrying out genocide intends to do that. It's not just a byproduct of something else that it is, it is doing, such as war. And secondly, uh, that the, the crime is committed against the group as such. And that's very important. That is, uh, that you're not killing people as um, only as individuals or doing anything else to them, such as depriving them of food or, or so forth, uh, but that you are doing it with the intent of destroying the group that they belong to. Uh, and your intention is to make that group uh, disappear, be destroyed, whether by killing or by other means. Um, and often, because genocide has been called uh, the crime of crimes, uh, it's it's supposed to be the the worst crime that uh, any state can perpetrate. There is a tendency to use that word, which was coined, you know, in 1943-44, uh, to use it against anything that we find abhorrent. Uh, but in fact, in international law, it has a particular definition, uh, and it doesn't mean that crimes against humanity are any better or worse, than genocide. It just means that they're defined differently. I just wanted to uh, drill down on one thing. The, the Is there a legal definition of destroy? Well, according to the UN resolution of 1948, uh, the intent to destroy, um, there's, there's a long list 
of how you you go about doing that. Uh, but what it means is to destroy the group as such. Hypothetically, that means that you don't necessarily have to kill anyone. Because if you, for instance, uh, remove the children of that group from the group, and you had them over to be adopted by another group, and you raise them as members of another ethnic, national, or religious group, and they have no idea of who they would have been otherwise, that could constitute genocide. Um, and, and that's actually how the term was used in the case of Australia and Canada, where children were taken away from indigenous populations. Um, it can also be uh, depriving a group of uh, the, the sources of its existence. Um, so if you move it to another place, if you say do what happened in the um, genocide of the Herero in uh, German Southwest Africa in 1904, uh, when the German military was called in by the white settlers, the German settlers who said there's an uprising of the Herero and the Nama people, and the military comes in there and says to the population, you have to go to the desert. You have to go to the Kalahari Desert. You are not, we are not going to allow you to stay here anymore because you constitute a danger to our own people. And at the same time, the army also takes care to plug in all the watering holes uh, in the desert that although you may not be killing them, you are sending them to certain death. Uh, and therefore, you are destroying that group as such. Um, and it's, it's important to understand that because you asked about the relationship between ethnic cleansing and genocide. And that's where we, we find that um, a somewhat of a gray zone. Ethnic cleansing as such is not defined in international law. It uh, comes under a crimes against humanity, under a list of potential crimes against humanity, uh, but what it actually is, is the removal of a group from a territory that you don't want them in because you want your own group to be there. Uh, whereas genocide, of course, is the attempt to destroy a group wherever it is. Um, but in reality, uh, as we could see in the genocide of the Herero in 1904, the genocide of the Armenians in 1915, uh, the genocide of the Jews, in fact, as well. The original goal was to remove the population from an area where you did not want them to be in. And then, under particular circumstances, you either move them to an area where they would die, or you decide, as the Nazis did, well, we have no place to move them to. So the most humane policy, as some Nazis said, is to kill them. Right. What I'd like to do is see how this applies to both Israel and Hamas and start off with Hamas. And there I really have two sets of questions. One is, early on you said, defined it, uh, uh, cry, or, or spoke about war, cry, wars of, uh, war crimes in terms of uh, a war between two states. Um, the question, of course, is, is Hamas a state? Um or is it a non-state actor, even though it does run a government in uh, in Gaza? And the other question is, the group's char charter is widely cited as evidence that it is a ge genocidal organization. Hamas's original charter, adopted in 1988, called for the killing of Jews, based on a saying attributed to Prophet Muhammad. Hamas adopted a new charter in 2017 that dropped the call to kill Jews. Even so, the new charter calls for Israel to be replaced by a Palestinian state in all of historic Palestine, but allows for the creation of a Palestinian state alongside Israel as an interim step. Would that be enough to qualify Hamas as a genocidal organization? So these, these are two important questions. Um, I think by large, um, and you know, that's, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, um, I'm not an international lawyer. Uh, my impression is that by and large, because Hamas has been was elected to power in Gaza, uh, because it is the hegemon in Gaza, um, it runs most of this, it all did, in fact. Now, of course, uh, there's a big mess there right now, but did run 
um, most of the institutions in Gaza, law enforcement, schools, uh, religious life, and so forth, whether people like it or not, uh, and has also a large um, arm, um, armed organization, uh, it could be seen as um, something resembling a government of a state. Uh, and from that point of view, I think that whatever it does uh, can be considered, let's say, the October 7th attack, uh, can be considered as something that was carried out. It took responsibility over that, uh, um, something carried out by a government of a particular entity, a kind of state. And under that, you, I think, would not have much trouble defining that as a war crime, uh, attack la on large numbers of civilians. You could also define it uh, likely as crimes against humanity, uh, because of the large numbers and the nature of the killing, which was particularly uh, atrocious. Uh, and then you come to the second question. Uh, the second question is, is Hamas an organization that actually wants to destroy the state of Israel? And you write that the, charter, that the original charter uh, actually lifts whole parts out of uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion, which is a kind of, you know, uh, a, a, a fabrication originally carried out by by by, by Russian secret police before World War One at the, the turn of the nineteenth century, um, uh, and is a kind of anti-Semitic canard. And then it also cites from the Quran the the most sort of anti-Jewish um, uh, elements there, um, and, and and is both an anti-Semitic document. I mean, just hair-raising document, uh, and talks about the destruction of the state. The revised version, the 2017, as far as I know, does not say that it replaces the previous charter. Uh, it's, um, it's, um, it's an adaptation of the charter to political conditions that existed at the time. And it has removed the anti-Semitic uh, elements there. And it's actually speaks about the fact that it is not against Jews, it is against Israel, uh, quite explicitly. And it also agrees, as you say, to, for an, to an interim uh, solution of two states. And it does it in large part so as to be in conformity with the Palestinian Authority. Um, this, is, this is part of the political game there. Uh, but at the core, I think Hamas actually wants to destroy the state of Israel. <clears throat> and what we have seen since October 7th is that a number of leaders of Hamas uh, have said publicly on television uh, that, they, that the October 7th attack will be repeated again and again, uh, that they will do that because that's the only way to deal with the Zionist entity, with the destroy the state of Israel. So does that make them... Uh, a genocidal organization. Uh, I think one can make the case for that. Um, I, uh, it's um, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I think what could make the case, and if that is true, then one could say, as I would understand it, that the attack of October 7th was at least a genocidal attack. Um, so obviously it, it did not, aim at um, killing all Jews uh, in Israel because it was not capable of doing that. But, it, but done under the general heading of the Hamas uh, conception of what he wants to do to create an Islamic Palestinian state in all of Palestine, perhaps. It takes you into uh, particularly difficult waters, though, uh, if you expand that to all kinds of ideologies that exist now on the other side, uh, that is in Israel, and we can talk about that. And that's why I'm a little cautious <clears throat> applying that category to Hamas. Indeed, that's where, where, where my next question was going to be, which is to look at the case of Israel, where, to the best of my knowledge, there is no official document laying out an adopted government policy that would qualify as evidence of intent to commit genocide. 
There are, however, numerous statements by senior officials and military officers that could qualify as signaling intent. Would that constitute evidence? And more generally, what qualifies as evidence? So, as I said before, uh, when, when, when you try to uh, see whether genocide is taking place or may uh, be in the offing, uh, you need two things, um, by and large. You need uh, statements of intent, and then you need to show that that intent is being implemented, that, 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 that there is an implementation of policy. Uh, Israeli leaders, uh, political leaders, including the Prime Minister, um, the Minister of Defense, and other um, cabinet ministers have made uh, statements that show an intent to destroy, uproot, flatten, remove um, Hamas, but they often slide from speaking about Hamas to speak about Gaza or speak about Gazans. And we have to remember that the vast majority of the population of Gaza are actually refugees or descendants of refugees uh, from what was uh, mandatory Palestine, uh, often from communities that are just or used to be just across the fence from uh, where the Gaza Strip is. So statements of intent have been made. One has to add to that that there have been other statements. Uh, and those other statements coming largely from military leaders uh, insist that what they're doing is they're trying to dismantle Hamas as a military organization. They are taking uh, great care not to harm the civilian population, but because Hamas uh, is in highly congested areas and has allegedly uh, placed its headquarters uh, and the hospitals, its missiles, its schools, or kindergartens, and so forth, uh, it has no choice, the IDF does, but to uh, also uh, harm civilians, and it says that that's the responsibility of Hamas. So you have two different types of statements. Uh, if you look more closely still at the implementation of policy, I would say you have two elements here. One is you have a clear, I would say, and I'm not the only one who's saying it, uh, disproportionality uh, between the military goals as they are articulated by the Israeli military and the number of civilians that are being killed. Uh, we have now uh, well over 12,000, that's the estimate, uh, of civilians killed. There may be more. I mean, some people, of course, argue that we can't trust Hamas figures, but on the other hand, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of people buried under the debris. Uh, and many of them are children. Uh, the population of Gaza is about 50% of the population are under 18. Uh, so, first of all, you have uh, vast disproportionality. It's not clear that Israel is really managed to dismantle uh, Hamas as a fighting organization. Maybe it did it in the city of Gaza, but certainly not in the entire Strip, and the numbers of losses are huge. And when you talk about this disproportionality, you're talking about both the immediate um, military goal and then the larger goal. What is actually your goal in killing so many people? Why, why are you doing it? Uh, and here the Israeli government has not articulated that clearly, uh, and we can get back to what that means. The second element that is very important to look at is the part of the Israeli military operation is based on removing the population of the northern part of Gaza to the southern part of Gaza. And so about a million people have been dislocated from northern Gaza to southern Gaza Strip. Um, where they're living under dire conditions, lacking all sufficient infrastructure for long-term uh, survival. Uh, and with the approach of winter now, things are going to get much, much worse very quickly. Um, meanwhile, um, Gaza has been flattened, as Israeli political and military leaders said they would. 
they have. And if you listen to the Israeli media, people are talking about that with glee. They, there, there have been reports from, from the ground uh, in Israel where you see the city of Gaza is flattened. It's just no houses are standing there. So even if the people who were removed from that area are allowed to go back, they have nothing to go back to. And right now, in the last two days, the Israeli army has also ordered people in the eastern part of southern uh, strip to move to its western part. Uh, because now they want to have military operations there. So they are, sh- con- they are constricting them increasingly into smaller and smaller territory. Now, I'll add one last thing to this, and, and, and that's really coming out just in the last few days. The, there is more and more talk in Israel uh, by various people related to the government of relocating the population as a humanitarian act. Okay, so just as the army was saying, it's humanitarian policy to move people out of the area of operations so that they don't get killed. Now, uh, various spokespeople, many of them connected to the uh, Kohelet organization, which were the people who launched the uh, judicial overhaul that everybody was excited about or, or mad about before the war. Uh, now they're saying, we should relocate them, perhaps to the Sinai Peninsula, perhaps to the Negev, and ultimately, maybe they should just be distributed as refugees, they're in any case refugees, to other countries. And then we'll have the Gaza Strip to ourselves and we'll be able to settle it again as we had done before Israel had moved out to the Gaza Strip. Uh, these kind of actions show a particular intent of ethnic cleansing that could also very easily become uh, genocidal actions. Uh, that is, of causing mass death to the population, removing it from the area wh- where it lives, and then uh, in attempting to destroy its own identity by moving it elsewhere, dispersing it around the world. Uh, you've said that there's no proof that Israeli operations in Gaza amount to genocide, but could qualify as war crimes or crimes against humanity, and that there is still time to prevent the war or the Gaza war from evolving into genocide. Would Israeli actions like the cutting off of the supply of essentials for human life, like food, the attacks on the hospitals, what you just mentioned, the unsafe moving of civilian populations, if not transferring them beyond the borders of the territory they live in, and collective punishment constitute evidence? So, you know, we are, we are right now in a kind of gray zone because uh, even what you're citing that I said, I said that uh, over a week ago, uh, and things have been changing. Um, I think that there is um, growing evidence of war crimes. Uh, there's growing evidence of crimes against humanity. Um, and if the policies that I just outlined are allowed to be implemented, then that could constitute genocide. They have not been implemented fully yet. That is, the population of Gaza is still there. Uh, what its fate will be, we don't know. Um, and I must add another element to it, which, in, to my mind, will make the difference between, uh, or poten- at, at least one difference, between this sliding toward genocide and not. And that is that the Israeli government has not articulated uh, what its policy for the day after is. The day after here is crucial. At some point, the fighting will stop. I mean, we don't know yet whether, you know, there may be a ceasefire, but a ceasefire doesn't mean that the fighting will stop. In 1948, there were various ceasefires, uh, fires, and then the fighting resumed. Uh, but at some point, the fighting will come to an end. What will happen then? If you look at those kind of plans that are being floated now in the Israeli media by all kinds of uh, spokespeople for the government, although the government has not said that itself, then there are two options here. 
One is that the Israeli government will want to continue what existed before, just without Hamas. That is, to remove Hamas and then to uh, put a big and better fence around the Gaza Strip, uh, better than the one that they quite easily overcame, uh, and say, we are not responsible for those people. They, they, they can rot there. We don't care. Uh, and then continue implementing its policy of the West Bank, which is partly ethnic cleansing, partly annexation, and massive settlement. Uh, I don't know whether that would be possible, but that's one possibility. That will mean that Gaza will remain the same thing and things will happen over and over again. Uh, the other option is a political option. If we don't think about uh, actually removing the population, as I said, uh, which could constitute genocide, the other option would be a political settlement, the beginning of a political um, um, negotiations and settlement between an Israeli political leadership and a Palestinian political leadership. That means that both the Israeli political leadership has to be replaced, and I think it will be replaced, it's totally discredited, uh, and a Palestinian political leadership will be replaced, and Hamas, I think, is also totally discredited, and the uh, um, the Palestinian Authority is extremely weak and unpopular and would also uh, have to be, the leadership would have to be changed. And there are potential leaders, although they're mostly in jail. Uh, but they're in Israeli jail, so it's not very difficult to release them. Uh, that would create a different paradigm. And creating that different paradigm could be the difference between sliding into an increasingly genocidal policy to sliding into or moving into something that could see uh, some silver lining at the end of all this killing. Uh, it's, it, I don't know if that is possible. I, it seems like this pressure on Israel to move in that direction. I don't think the pressure is sufficient. Uh, but I think that that's the in many ways, the only means by which we could prevent this from becoming even worse and potentially a genocidal situation. I want to come back to the day after in a, in a second, but I'd like to sort of first just clarify something, which is uh, you essentially have a situation in which uh, the siege of uh, Gaza for all practical matters. So no food coming in, water, electricity, uh, fuel uh, is essentially robbing the the uh, the territory from the essentials of life. Now, clearly, there have been today some development with uh, a minimal amount of fuel being allowed into. Uh, into Gaza, but nonetheless, doesn't that in itself, uh, uh, or, or does that in itself uh, constitute uh, intent? If you're starving people of food, of water, of, of potable water, electricity, fuel, and so on. Yes, look, I mean, um, um, it's it's a complicated situation. First, because uh, this is a sort of moving target, as as you said, and I think that the Israeli military and the political uh, authorities are trying to um, balance things more or less in a way that they put increasing pressure on the population on the one hand, but that they don't that um, they're not seen as entirely starving it of resources. So they're sort of trying to find a balance, and, and that is clearly the reason that they've allowed fuel in today. They're even saying that. There is another element that in, in the sort of laws of war, uh, blockade or siege is not entirely impermissible. Um, so even if we look at it... Um, as a war crime, um, there are conditions under which, if you look at, say, the British blockade of uh, Germany in uh, World War I, um, yeah. uh, it, it, there's, there's a difference between a blockade that could be, or a siege, that could be uh, defined as military strategy and one that is not allowed. 
Uh, and I think that at this point, uh, Israel, you know, and they have a phalanx of lawyers who constantly look at what they're doing. The, the Israeli army is uh, constantly working with lawyers, which is sort of interesting on, on its own. Uh, they are trying to position themselves just on this sort of margin between a war crime and a non-war crime. Uh, so I'm 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 skeptical about that um, being right now defined as a war crime, as opposed to indiscriminate bombing and destruction, uh, which I think uh, would be easier to be defined as such. Um, but if you move from the category of war crimes to one of genocide, then um, Making the lives of people in a particular territory impossible, that is creating conditions that no longer allow life over time, uh, then you could start, as I said, combined with relocation or ethnic cleansing or removal of, popul of population, uh, you are creating conditions by the actual removing of the population and congesting them in one area. Uh, then you are beginning to move into a situation that is clearly pre-genocidal and could easily flip to the other side. Um, and, and, and that's where uh, only political intervention uh, can stop that. It, it can't just be uh, part of military strategy. There has to be a political horizon as to what happens next. Um, and it can move in two ways, uh, but right now it's stuck, and as long as it's stuck, then the dying will only increase, and the closer we come to something that we could identify as genocide. I want to come back to that in one minute. One last question in this direction, though. You're no doubt familiar with the lawsuit against uh, President Joe Biden, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and Secretary of uh, Defense Austin Lloyd filed by the Center for Constitutional Rights. The complaint asserts that they are complicit in genocide committed by Israel in the lawsuit. Uh, William Shabas, a prominent genocide and legal scholar, cites Israeli government statements, deadly military assault, and a total siege as signs of genocide. Genocide and Holocaust scholars John Cox, Victoria Sanford, and Barry Trachtenberg cite as evidence a comparison of Israeli intentions and actions with other ge genocides in recent history. What is your assessment of that? Look, I mean, these are all people that I greatly admire and I've uh, read Shabbos, and they are people who are much better versed than I am in international law. So um, I don't want to um, debate uh um, the law with them. Uh, they know it better than I do. I, I can only say that um, my own feeling is that while there have been statements uh, made by the prime minister, uh, by the chief of staff, also highly dehumanizing statements, we haven't talked about that, you know, speaking about Hamas or Gaza as human animals and so forth, uh, or, or the statement by the, by uh, Isaac Herzog, the president, there are no innocents. Exactly, oh. which, yeah, yeah, which is especially extraordinary coming from from Herzog, who is, uh, uh, but we used to think of him as uh, being a much more moderate um, uh, politician in Israel. Um, so, despite those statements. Um, my my own sense, and I I may be wrong in this, uh, and you know, and I've I've said that those statements show intent, but my own sense is that the current policy of the government and of the military is not to destroy the civilian population of Gaza. That is, that it may happen, and then their statements will uh, be used against them, as they should. Uh, but that their own policy right now is not that, but it's evolving in that direction. And that's why I was speaking about the relocation. Um, these ideas for the next phase, what is the next phase of this war? Uh, but I don't 
think that right now there are people uh, in government or at the top uh, military echelons uh, saying uh, we basically have to get rid of this group altogether in one way or another. Uh, the statements have an effect. They have an effect on the soldiers on the ground. Uh, a a a a, uh, a brutalizing effect on the soldiers on the ground. They're giving license to soldiers by talking about the population in those terms. Um, and as I say, if the policies move in the direction of actual attempt to remove the population further, then those statements that were made will be seen as an intention to destroy um, uh, Palestinians as such as a group. Uh, I don't think that that up to now has been the policy. Uh, I think many of these statements were made uh, sort of uh, in the heat of the moment, uh, in rage, also because the army, and that's a, a very important element, the army uh, on all echelons feels humiliated. It feels that its honor, it lost its honor, and, and people on the ground are talking about it in those terms. We have to restore our honor as well as deterrence. And so they use that kind of language, but the situation on the ground, what they're doing, and the way they're talking combined, I think can devolve into genocide. Uh, so uh, we are, and have been now, but are increasingly on the brink. Um, and in the long run, uh, people like Shabbos may be shown to have been correct. Um, I tend to believe that this can actually be stopped. I also am not sure that the right policy is to sue Biden and Blinken. I think as the, the way I see it, I hope that Biden and Blinken and, 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 and the, the, the Secretary of Defense and other people uh, will actually steer Israel in a different direction, not just by persuasion, but by real pressure. And the U.S. right now has an immense ability for pressure on Israel because Israel, uh, all those politicians who just before the war in Israel were saying uh, the U.S. should mind its own business and we want to change our legal system and so forth. Within days, Israel became dependent on immediate urgent supplies of uh, military hardware to Israel. Uh, and that is huge leverage. Uh, and they could do it publicly or they could do it privately, but they're obviously not doing enough of that. And I would much rather they did that than them trying to defend themselves, uh, you know, uh, whether they are complicit in genocide or not, uh, actually carrying out actions that would prevent things from getting worse. In fact, if one looks at the uh, 2021 war we're in Gaza, uh, in many ways, Biden pursued the, the same strategy, the bear hug, if you wish. Uh, but finally, on the 10th day of the war, had to come out publicly and make very clear what he, that he, what he wanted for the Israelis and, and Hamas, but in this case, primarily the Israelis, to a day later declare a ceasefire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, I mean, it's different now because the scale is completely different. The scale is unprecedented uh, on both sides. And one, and, and one has to, to take that in. I mean, uh, about a thousand civilians uh, murdered uh, in Israel and Israeli towns taken over by Hamas. That has not happened. Uh, towns take, taken over has not happened since 1948 or settlements. And um, um, this number of Jewish victims, uh, civilians, has not happened since 1945. Uh, and the shockwaves in Israel are huge. The sense of, of pain and mourning is enormous. Uh, I hear it all the time. Um, and on the other hand, the number of civilians that Israel has killed now uh, in the Gaza Strip is also unprecedented. Uh, compared to all its previous actions there, um, which were often horrific on their own. I mean, in 2014, 500 children died from Israeli um, um, uh, Arab bombardments, um, and that 
I thought was clearly a war crime, uh, was never adjudicated as such. Uh, and now we are talking about four or 5,000, possibly, children alone. Uh, so the scale has exploded, uh, and, and, and action is needed, and it has to come from the U.S. government. There's, there, there's no one else uh, who can actually immediately bring about a change in policy. But they have to make that decision, and they obviously have not made it yet. Before we go back to the day after, I'd like to follow up in terms of uh, the, mili the Israeli military. One gets the impression that attitudes towards Palestinians among the rank and file of the Israeli military have hardened even before the, this war erupted. It's apparent in the frequent failure of the military to intervene when vigilante civilians attack Palestinians on the West Bank, or soldiers planting Israeli flags on mosques and homes when raiding West Bank refugee camps, towns, and villages. I wonder how much of this has to do with the rise of officers like we saw in 2014 with Brig then Colonel, now Brigadier General o Ofer Winter, who as commander of the Givadi Brigade declared that the Gaza war is a religious war and it's conscious, you know, and, and therefore there's, there's been this rawification in attitudes within the Israeli military. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, the Israeli military is a very different animal from uh, what it was when I served in it in the 1970s. It's, it's really something very different, and it's different uh, on a number of levels, I would say. Um, first of all, there is what you identify, uh, what's called Hadata in Ethro, um, um, that the army is becoming more and more religious. Uh, more and more people serving in the army are people who come uh, from religious background, <clears throat> and they don't come from the ultra-Orthodox, they come from the national religious movement, more and more from among the settlers, uh, and they are not because they uh, are more religious as Jews, but because they come from particular yeshivot, particular um, uh, religious leaders, religious mentors, uh, who are very extreme politically and who have a completely different view of what Israel is about and what its mission is. Uh, they are not particularly interested in democracy and liberalism and pluralism or anything of that sort. The most uh, extreme representatives of that kind of movement are right now in the Israeli government, uh, Smotrich and Ben -Fier. These people talk about Jewish supremacy. There's, there's, there's no way to speak otherwise about it. That's how they speak themselves. They speak of a total and complete right of Israel to all of Eretz Israel, to all of the land of Israel, which they don't like defining. But often what they mean is it certainly includes Gaza. It, of course, includes the West Bank. It may include also parts of Lebanon. It can include lands across the Jordan. They have no borders to that because that's a sort of vague notion of what the land of Israel is. So this is one thing that has moved into the military. Uh, another uh, important element is that the, the Israeli military now is really divided socially. Um, Fewer people serve in the military proportionately than served when I was in the Israeli army in the 1970s. Uh, and large parts of those who do go to serve in the military serve in intelligence and air force. The intelligence is huge. It, it didn't pan out to be as effective as one would have hoped, but it's huge. Uh, and the air force is Israel's basically what the Germans called Wunderwaffe, the wonder weapon. That's really where Israel is completely superior to its neighbors. But the rest, uh, those who go to be infantry, uh, to be in the armored units, they come from particular parts of the country. Uh, they don't come from the better educated groups. They don't come from the center, from Tel Aviv and Haifa. They come from the so-called periphery. Uh, 
And so you also have a social divide within the army itself. Mm -hmm. Those people who support the more right-wing elements in Israeli society happen to also be serving in those units. And the last thing, and maybe the most important, is that the Israeli army, for the last 56 years, has been largely the, the infantry units. Now, those people are on the ground, the grunts, have been uh, spending much of the last 56 years as policemen. They police the occupation. You have generations of young men and women who, what they do in their military service with all their fancy uniform and all that, and high and sophisticated guns, is they break into people's homes at four in the morning to enforce occupation. They stand in roadblocks and stop ambulances from heading to uh, ambulances. They, they harass old women, children. This is what they've been doing. And so that process brutalizes people. It brutalizes the occupier and it brutalizes the occupied. And in that sense, we could see that when I was in the army. I, I, I remember just before I went to the army, we already then in the early 1970s were demonstrating and saying occupation corrupts. And that occupation had begun only in 1967 when I was 13 years old. You have now young Israelis who have no memory of that at all. Their memory is of them basically bossing it over another population. That population, in their own minds, without even any ideology, because of the, 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 the realities on the ground, are inferior to them. They can do whatever they want to them, which is why, partly, that attack by Hamas has been so traumatic. Because those people who, yeah, they could lob rockets at us every once in a while, but we're seen as basically a match. I mean, we, we can de uh, destroy them without any problems. We put a few of these, uh, there were mostly female um, uh, soldiers in these observation towers over the, the fence, and we, we can catch them, no problem at all. And suddenly... They came in thousands, and the Israeli army took hours and hours and hours to get there and then to get control of the situation. That was the humiliation, the sense of shame that is in the Israeli army now, if you want to sort of understand its psychology. It has to do also with the fact that, uh, turns out, we are not that superior. Turns out, they can actually fight back. And therefore, what we need to do is to show them who has monopoly of power and flatten them. And on that, I'm afraid right now, there's a huge consensus in Israel. That's not just this government. Uh, it, it can change. It can flip. But right now, what I hear coming uh, from Israel is they have to learn that they can never do that again to us. I want to come back finally to the day after and the implications that has in terms of preventing a genocide. Um, my reading of the situation is bleak. Uh, one, we don't know that Hamas will be destroyed in this. Uh, but even if it's destroyed, what Hamas stands for for many Palestinians is armed resistance. And that notion is becoming more popular, certainly in the West Bank. I mean, we don't know what effect on uh, Hamas's standing the war in Gaza will have inside Gaza, whether that will reinforce people's uh, uh, feeling or, or, or sympathy for armed struggle and maybe reverse what was uh, uh, a decline in popularity for Hamas prior to the war. But also, uh, you spoke about what you know, all these various statements that Israeli leaders have made. <clears throat> the, issue, the notion of, uh, of transferring the population, turning them into migrants go, spread across the globe, is a notion that goes far beyond the government. If you look at someone like Ramba, um, the, I think it's Ramba Ram, uh, the uh, who's contending now for leadership of the opposition party, he has advocated distributing uh, Gazans across the globe. Um, and 
clearly the, the Palestine Authority in its current uh, constellation is not really a, 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 a legitimate contender. Uh, the likelihood that Israel would release leaders like Marwan Bahruti from Israeli prison so that a new Palestinian leadership could uh, emerge, given the breadth of of, uh, uh, of of sentiment across Israel, irrespective of supportive of the government or not, which basically means there is no exit plan. Um, Arab states aren't interested in putting boots on the ground there. Uh, the Turks are the only ones who've so far volunteered that for all practical matters, which really leaves you with, with a situation in which you either get total anarchy or the Israelis, even against their own will, have to take over the daily administration. Yes, look, I mean, uh, uh, none of this is... Uh... Simple and as I said, we really don't know yet uh, where things are heading. I think that it's it's quite possible that things will uh, turn out as you just outlined. Um, there's there's a high possibility of that. Uh, I believe that there is uh, another way of looking at this, um, and you know, um, uh, two months before. Uh, the October 7th attacks, uh, colleagues of mine and I uh, issued a statement um, that was signed by um, about 2,500 uh, senior scholars and uh, religious leaders and so forth. It, it was called the elephant in the room. Uh, and we then warned at the time that even the protest movement against Netanyahu's so-called judicial overhaul at the time was refusing to face the elephant in the room, which was the occupation, and that in fact what the government was doing even then was an attempt to perpetuate the the occupation, to sweep the Palestinian issue under the carpet, and to eventually annex uh, large parts of the West Bank. The fact of the matter is, and so okay, so that of course exploded in our faces on October seventh this attempt to say, well, we, we can deal with the Arab states, with the world and all that, and everybody will forget about the Palestinians, right? But the fact of the matter is that there's 7 million Jews and 7 million Palestinians in areas under Israeli control. And most of these people are not going anywhere. They're there to stay. The Jews are and the Palestinians are. Now, you could envision, and I know that there are people in Israel who are envisioning it, somehow to remove them all, to somehow get rid of two and a half million Palestinians in Gaza, three million Palestinians in the West Bank, and maybe also the two million Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, uh, somehow wake up tomorrow morning and they'll be gone. And I think that there are people among Palestinians, <clears throat> probably not a few, who also would like to wake up one morning and see that all the Jews are gone, they've gone back to where they came from, or somehow they've disappeared. But nobody is going anywhere. And because nobody is going anywhere, the question is, do those two groups continue slaughtering each other, or do they not? Do they finally understand that they have to share that land? And if they come to that understanding that they cannot make the other group disappear, not in mind, not in body, not in spirit, they're there, then they have to find some way to live together. And there are actually ideas as to how to do that. It's not a pie in the sky. The problem is that um, radical politicians of both sides, or radical and incompetent in most cases, uh, have uh, always, whenever there was a possibility that something would change, immediately um, started using the most radical elements on the other side to make it appear impossible. Uh, you probably remember that in the early 90s, when, uh, when the Oslo Accords were sort of being debated, uh, people thought about Gaza as the great promise. Gaza would have an international airport and seaport and money would flow in and it, it would Dubai. be like the Dubai of the Middle East or Hong Kong of the Middle East or something like that. And Hamas, 
became very weak because Hamas thrives on insecurity, on desperation, on, on poverty, um, just like extreme extremists in Israel. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the heads of Hamas and you look at the uh, Netanyahu's coalition partners, they're mirror images of each other. They're both thinking of the same thing. They want to be rid of the other side and have it all. Uh, and they are sort of messianic in, in their worldview. Um, but you could think about it differently. And I believe that most people in Gaza, in the West Bank, uh, in the Galilee, in Tel Aviv, uh, would rather uh, have a better future for their children and not think that their children would have to again engage in all these kind of wars that we're seeing right now. And there are plans for that. And they're good plans. But you need a new political leadership. And here, people have to stand up. People do have a responsibility. Uh, both Palestinians, and it's much more difficult for Palestinians, and Israeli Jews, and it's less difficult for them, to stand up and to remove those corrupt, extreme leaders and find for themselves better leaders. And they can, do, they can be helped in doing that by, first of all, the American administration, but also by Americans, not least American Jews, who would actually put pressure on their own constituencies, on their own government, to steer Israel in a direction that is better for it, which is a direction of compromise. And Israel, which says that Palestinians understand only the language of power, is a country that understands only the language of power. And it's time to exert some of that on the current government. Irma, on that note, this has been a very incisive conversation, and we could go on for hours, but unfortunately, time is not our friend. I wish we had more time to follow through, but we'll certainly have another opportunity. Nevertheless, thank you for this taking the time, and all the best. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed today's column and podcast. The Turbulent World, with James M. Dorsey, depends on the support of its readers. For the past 12 years, I have maintained free distribution as a way of maximizing impact. I'm determined to keep it that way. However, to avoid putting up a paywall, I need the support of a core of voluntary paid subscribers to cover the cost of producing the column and podcast. If you believe that the column and podcast add value to your understanding and that of the broader public, please consider becoming a paid subscriber. You can do so by clicking on Substack on the subscription button at www.jamesmdorsey.substack.com and choosing one of the subscription options. Thank you, take care, and best wishes.